Welcome to the Soft Code Leaders series, where we invite experts from both industry and sport to share their insights into leading business transformation or leading teams. I'm delighted today to uh, welcome Ronan O'Gara, who's going to talk to us about leadership and managing teams. Ronan is a former Irish rugby international and is the current coach of La Rochelle in the top French 14 league. Some stats for you on Ronan. He's the second most capped Irish player with 128 caps. He's the highest ever point scorer, won three Triple Crowns in the Grand Slam in 2009. He's been on three Lions Tours and has played 16 seasons for Munster, winning the Heineken Cup twice. As a Leinster fan, I thoroughly enjoy talking with Ronan. So Ronan, thank you for joining us. How is France? Hi, Susan. I'm great, Jess. All, all, all excellent here. Uh, weather is getting good. Season is getting competitive and um, things are um, beginning to hot up a bit. Uh, dog of a competition this season. Very, very competitive and uh, all to play for. Very good. Uh, look, you, you changed from the role of player to coach. How did you adapt to that? I mean, was it tough hanging up the boots? Now you're watching you know, players perform and you've come from that. Was that kind of a tough transition? Yeah, I, I think it's very difficult to describe it accurately. I think you, your body, your mind is dealing with a huge uh, grieving period for 24, 36 months, no doubt about it. Uh, I think the further you go as a player in the game, the tougher it is to, um, to move on. Uh, it takes a long time time but like everything time is a healer and you get better at handling and you get better at moving on uh, with different I suppose purpose and ambition in your life and I was always fascinated by the I suppose the human side of trying to get the best out of people uh, when I was a player I'm not too sure I did it very well as a player but uh, I certainly let them know my feelings but I think as you mature as you get wiser you 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 learn what buttons to push better and, and how you bring people along and how you can potentially lose people so uh, I suppose just the whole human side of the game really fascinates me like you were an out half um was that good prep for coaching and for those who don't know what an out half is they're really the quarterback uh, who run the game so have you been compared to Tom Brady are you inclined to come back and like he has done um, or do you think uh, an out half is a great one to go from there into coaching? Yeah, the, the, the big difference between, I suppose, American football and rugby union is that rugby union is a phase game. NFL is is, is a set piece. Everything can be kind of preordained and you, you essentially can get very well protected. In, in rugby union, you can't. Uh, and it doesn't happen like that. But I suppose, yeah, the big learning for me as a player going into the coaching was you're know, trying to set up your players to succeed with a game plan you would like to play it under. So potentially, Susan, giving my team options A, B and C, having a structure, but obviously not making them robotic in the fact mm -hmm. that you don't want to know, understand what option they are going to take, but you know probably the three of them, but you don't know or you're not interested in having shall we say, every um, elaborate movement boxed off. I'm a big fan mm -hmm. of trusting your instincts, playing in the moment, staying in the moment, next ball policy. But also, you got to respect defences and you got to respect teams that have their homework done. They're going to be just as well prepared as you. You have to assume that. But mm -hmm. what I hope will give us an advantage would be maybe um, your work off the ball, you're getting set before the defence, but also when pressure comes on that you have not only option A and B, but option A, B and C, and then it's up to your decision makers to pull the trigger on which one they want. Yeah, like one of the most challenging things for all of us in business is managing people, motivating them to succeed. You're dealing with a team of real high performers. What's your approach to that? Yeah, there's some interesting um I suppose, nuggets in, in, in that conversation before you start, I think um, one should never assume because they're in professional rugby players or professional sports people or people of high rank in business that they're performing. That is the greatest, um, I suppose, concept I'm understanding as you move along in the journey of life that you sometimes titles don't reflect ability. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of politics and a lot of... Um, 
in a lot of arenas, and that that's that's not a good thing. So I think sometimes perception is reality, and other times perception is not reality. For me, one of the key uh, pieces of advice I would give is make judgments yourself. Don't go by what other people say. I think it's up to you to kind of dig in there and see the layers behind the person because some people may not uh, appeal to this person and they might close down. Mm. Other people may thrive under under this pe person's leadership. Um, so it really is an interesting topic in terms of how the best you get out of people, how best you bring them along. Why do people not grow under certain regimes as opposed to other regimes? And I've always found that people thrive when they get encouraged. Mm. It's a great and probably underappreciated tool in, in, in modern society that uh, when you're doing something well, you should congratulate someone, you should tell them they're doing well, and I think you get more out of them. It's very easy to criticise and say that will never work, that will never work. But, uh, yeah, we all need feedback, be it... Uh, negative and constructive at times, but also probably uh, some branches of hope where it may grow into a positive as opposed to, no, that won't work. What we're looking for is solution-based uh, options to, to grow as a person, but also as an organization. And how do you deal with the superstars? You know, when you have to give them bad news or maybe your best player isn't going to be your captain, how do you deal with that? One of the, I suppose, findings for me is that uh, the so-called superstars or competitors or best players need very little management. Mm. I find the tier two and two, tier three players uh, most difficult. The people seeking it as you opened your conversation with motivation. Mm. Uh, our job as leaders not to motivate. If the person isn't motivated, that's their problem. Yeah. He loses, she loses. They're not going to get better. Like the world we live in is full of potential. We don't know our limit. People try to put limits on other humans, but you shouldn't. We don't know mm -hmm. how or where this is going to take us. But the most important thing for me, Susan, is you have to enjoy the journey. Enjoy the now. Go after it. Stay in the moment. Embrace it. Live it. You're going to have massive failures. Yeah, but the most successful people fail more. I think a lot of people who are insecure they they become very narrow. They become very skeptical. They don't. They're not open to to criticism. While for me, secure people share ideas. Secure people are happy to, you know, what I mean, throw ideas out there. Yeah, because they've moved on to the next idea and they're already ahead of the curve. But uh, it, it's a very interesting topic in the fact that you know people get spooked if they left their. Um, game plan on a on a computer or if they left their game plan in the back of a taxi or uh fearful that the opposition uh may gain an advantage but the nowadays with the data all the opposition can can access everything and so i mean for you if you're losing sleep over that i think you're missing a trick you need to be kind of moving on to what's next and how can I get the best out of out of my people? And as you know, in business, especially in your company, you're dealing with a lot of people. And if you've more than 50 employees or 40 players, I have pros without even talking about academy players. Imagine the amount of time or investment needed in each and every one of them. So to be looking at, uh, you mean, what the referee may do to us at the weekend, I think you're, you're really living in the life of luxury if that's your, if that's what your uh, daily operation is you have a great culture i mean you've, you have people from all different cultures as well you know how do you mold people with different views cultures backgrounds into being a whole sort of a team that works together towards those goals how do you manage that so we're more only in our infancy that's yeah. the reality i think anything that's you want to create that sustainable doesn't happen or grow overnight. And I think you have to make this very natural and organic and it has to come from the players, but the leaders in the, in the environment can work behind the scenes and they can, I suppose, um, create an environment that's real. That's very important to me. And the fact that when players see me, it's the same me as when I go home, when I'm at a weekend, when I'm not in rugby camp, 
that for me has been authentic. So many leaders in that regard put on a mask. I don't want that in my organization. I want people to be themselves. We have Georgians, South Africans, Fijians, Australians, mm -hmm. New Zealand, um, South African players operating in France where uh, French players are the most important, obviously, because it's their home country. But we speak French, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult uh, for everyone uh, because our ability at speaking it is some are obviously very fluent and very natural, while some of us are raw at that. But that's not an excuse not to communicate. There's, you mean, nonverbal communication. Uh, there are many methods of communicating that that is very powerful in, in the in the environment or in your workplace nowadays that you can make your feelings be known. I think the big thing that we work is for trying to establish what our values are. Values then for me uh, can be lived if you. Um, exhibit or, or um, show um, daily behaviors. What are daily behaviors? Uh, you're trying to create an environment where it'd be like uh, you as a dad, you create as a family. It's trying to create an environment where we have respect. Respect is so powerful. It's such a great word. But the opposite to respect is non-respect. And that mm -hmm. applies to the game, but it also applies to people. Uh, work hard. What does work hard look like? It looks very different to everybody, depending where you're from. Irish people are traditional hard workers. Polish people, Eastern European people are hard workers. Mm -hmm. uh, people, you mean from South America, um, the you know Argentinian players are, are Latin temperate. Italian players Latin temperate. Emotion. You have to tap into that side. Of Fijian mm -hmm. players uh, like to be hugged, like to be cuddled, mm -hmm. like to be they're back to be robbed. It's very, very important. Roland, there's a few of your Argentinian players that'll be very happy to hug. I can tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what's great the, about you, Susan. You can call it. I like it. <laughs> there's an on the whole international aspect talking to you before. One of, them, one of them might be one of your ex Leinster coaches going to coach the Argentinian national team. <laughs> <laughs> I like Never say anything against Leinster. I know you really love to coach them, but there you go. <laughs> uh, listen, one thing I did want to say to you, you talked to me a long time ago when we talked previously about the different mindset. Now, you're talking about the international players, but the different mindset that you found when you coached in New Zealand uh, versus Europe. Um, have you found now that you've been a number of years in France that you've utilised the different approach that you found in New Zealand? Was it more professional? What was the difference? I, I, it's a great question, Susan. For me, I think I'd start with uh, how grateful I am. I think I got turned inside out and upside down when I went to the Crusaders environment because that is growth mindset. I lived it. I tasted it. I drank it. I sang it. I believed in it when I left. For four months, I was in denial because I was most definitely a half glass empty person. And it was... So, I suppose, staggering for me now as a young coach to realise as a player when I went in on a Monday morning representing my country that the coach in front of me didn't believe we'd beat New Zealand that weekend. That rattles me. It still does. Uh, I was brought up in the era from we're part of a tiny country, how great it is to be involved at world level how great it is to be playing European Cup Finals. There's nothing great about that. Why wouldn't we play European Cup Finals? Why wouldn't we win European Cup Finals? Why put a limit on us? Why are we so appreciative to take the field with other people? Why can't we have ambition? Why can't we be the best in the world? Why should we be boxed into this category? So what I found was the consistency of behaviour of... Uh, people in the Crusaders, 70 to 100 people, genuinely putting the team first. I was very lucky to grow up in Munster where that was the case. And, and with the Irish team, it was the case. And with the Lions, it was the case. But I think uh, even in those environments, there was maybe, uh, you know what I mean, one or two sour apples in the group. Mm. But genuinely, uh, for the first time, I, I saw an environment where the goal was what's best for the team. Let's buy in here. Let's do everything that's possible. I only play four games a year. But once I'm in the Crusaders, my goal 
is to have that champions medal at the end of the season and I know that my contribution is valued, is respected, appreciated, as opposed to being a starter in any one of the other franchises, be the Bulls, the Chiefs, or the Highlanders, uh, or the Hurricanes, and not have that medal. So they created an environment that was hugely high performing, but also one with respect, but also one where uh, the team took priority over the individual. Very, very powerful. Yeah, I mean, you've taken La Rochelle now to new heights. So I'm assuming you've actually brought those values and that belief system to La Rochelle. Business and sport would be so easy if it was transferable from environment to environment. I'll give you one uh, probably, what's the word, uh, uh, statement or fact. So you could play three Super Rugby campaigns in one top 14 season. So by applying the sprint formula to a top 14 marathon, you're dealing with completely different mindsets, uh, structures, uh, systems. You cannot go from, you know what I mean, having intensity in training and looking to be able to be alive for 11 months of every season. So yeah. it's a very, very different track we're running when you're in super rugby. It's more like a Formula One sprint as opposed to the top 14, is a marathon, the survival of the fittest, the mentally strongest. And that's not to say one is better than the other, but it, 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 as you know, when you get experienced, you, you can't just apply uh, the one model to, to any, any, any system. For, you know, in, for example, in Sofco, you can't uh, you obviously just put one software in and expect it to apply to everything. That's yeah, it's presume. different markets is what you're saying. Different markets, different environments. Uh, that's what you're Correct. saying. It's not necessarily transferable. Um, tell me, tell me a little bit about pressure. I mean, do you see your, your job as a coach taking pressure off your team when you have all those, you know, multiple competitions happening at the same time, you know, Mourinho was a past master at it. Uh, are you able to, you know, do you see yourself in the same kind of role, take pressure off uh, your, your team at key times? I'll give you a little bit of context. There's two um, sayings that pop into my mind uh, when, whenever I hear pressure. So the great Anthony Foley, God rest him, said mm -hmm. pressure is for tires. And the great Dan Carter said pressure is a privilege. Mm -hmm. So for me, all I've been doing since I've been uh, very young is, is playing rugby, involved in rugby. I know it. I enjoy it. I, I live for it. It's, it's my passion. Yes, there's responsibilities. That's probably pressure. But um, I'm not uh, shaped, dictated, um, or formulated by, by, by pressure. For me, I see the opportunity getting involved in a sporting team to create history, to create something that has not been done before for young kids, boys, girls to express themselves, to have a go, to live their dreams, to get back out of a sport. What I got, I think that's my message to people in the fact, uh, La Rochelle, we've never won anything. The boys do not know what the taste of victory mm -hmm. tastes like. Once you taste it, it becomes very, very addictive. It took me six years to win a European Cup of Munster. Six years, imagine. I cost... So many legends of the game, my individual performance at medal in, in, in 2000 because I missed uh, every kick a goal. Imagine the point scored the quarterback in the NFL uh, Super Bowl final having such an off day that uh, he contributes zero to the final. So for me, what a learning experience. Get better or get beaten. Uh, you know I mean? A failure is a route to get better. And uh, once you take the harsh messages, I think it, it creates all kinds of possibilities. So for me, I'm trying to uh, tell these boys that I coach that it's, it's very, very difficult to win. But keep knocking at the door. Keep knocking at the door. Someday the door will fall off. You don't know which day. But yeah. I hope you're in the building when it happens because it's a bloody great feeling. And I think they're getting to buy into it. And, and that's very powerful as a leader to see people grow in front of you. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, you also said at one time that you used to dread taking uh, penalty kicks, but you flipped it on its head to loving, looking forward to it. How did you manage to do that? I mean, that's a big pressure situation. I think that's what experience is, and that's what's getting used to your workspace looks like. I'm the kicker, I'm the points accumulator, I need to get points for my team. That's 
that's my job. That's what it says on the tin. Now, I remember the great Welsh out half, Neil Jenkins. Um, I was on a, a Lions tour with him. And he was a brilliant kicker. Uh, and he had a, had a great expression, one that I, I retained for early in my career. And it w- went along, uh, you know, and it was exactly, uh, you, know, you don't see the postman looking for thanks when he delivers letters. So that was his mentality. So don't thank me when I kicked the ball over the bar. I thought it made it very, um, it took the emotion out of it. That's yeah. my job. That's what I'm expected to do. And as you said, for when I was a young player, uh, I most definitely struggled, I suppose, with with uh, self confidence, self belief, uh, a little bit of an act. It was thinking that you are more performing uh, than you'd like to be, but then that's what experience is: is putting yourself in the same position over and over again, and getting comfortable with it. And I suppose staying true to yourself, knowing that you got to, you've worked hard in your technique. The conditions aren't aren't difficult, and you should be performing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't, wouldn't mind asking you, did you have a mentor or who did you look up to over the years? Um, yeah, I think obviously my dad was very close to me and was very beneficial to me. Um, but then sometimes your dad is too close because he's not able to accurately, well, he is able to accurately call it, but sometimes with the father or son, you struggle to take their information on board. Uh, I had a lot of people probably, not a lot, but certain people outside of the rugby bubble that I would kind of take advice from. Very select few, mind you, that were, uh, I thought, very sharp sporting minds that were able to give me advice on potential improvements. Um, more so in the in the mindset space as opposed to the, the technical and technical side of the game. And do you find you're, you're better able to handle media scrutiny at this stage? Uh, you know, you have had in your game highs and lows. Uh, is that difficult to deal with the media? Yeah, well, even so, since I've retired, it's changed completely again because social media has become yeah the big driving sport force, and that must be very, very difficult for for young players, especially players that are trying to establish themselves in the game. But the reality mm-hmm. nowadays, Susan, is that everyone is a journalist with Instagram or Twitter. That's everyone true. has an opinion, and everyone thinks their opinion is just as important as established sports journalists. Sure. So uh, you should hope that the players nowadays are, are mentally strong to be able to, to deal with that. But you, I can certainly admit that there were times as players you'd be very disappointed with certain mm-hmm. things written because it's okay to attack you as a or give an opinion as you as a rugby player. But when characters questions, when sometimes it is in modern sporting people, it becomes very difficult to separate that. And as a result, you fall out of love with the media. But then if you fall out of love with the media, sometimes the media portray as a certain bad guy. And that's not necessarily the case with a lot of sports people, I find. Sure. Um, just on to the future, what's your ambition now for La Rochelle uh, going forward and even what you would like to achieve going forward? It's not avoiding your question, Susan, but it's to be as best as we can be. Yeah. For so I mean, I, has your outlook changed? I talked to a lot of people at the moment uh, since the pandemic. We see it in our own company. People are taking different decisions because, you know, the pandemic was fairly stark. You know, has your outlook on life changed going through that process? And going through a uh, post-COVID, uh, not necessarily. I think probably, uh, I probably would have defined everything by medals. Mm. I think, yeah, silverware is absolutely crucial and that winner, competitor environment and uh, mentality inside me will never leave me. But also, you can be very successful by seeing your team grow. And that's not looking to give myself breathing space or our time time in the job it just it's very i mean one team wins the european cup and one team wins france but you look at last year when it was uh in in la rochelle we made huge progress of a club yeah. now we have to try and uh drive that on and do as well this season it's always harder when your standard has raised probably so quickly in such a short space of time can we sustain that but i think we can and i think i think uh there's exciting times ahead for this club yeah. I mean, one thing for us was sport was a fantastic distraction 
during the pandemic. We really welcomed anything that was on the television. Uh, I won't even tell you the various sports that I watched, but it was fantastic to have it. What was your outlet during that time? Or were you still very involved with the team? Yeah, it was actually, Susan. I yeah. was very involved. And um, it was so probably uh, so destroying at times playing an empty stadium. Yeah. It's only now looking back. And, and uh, I did make a, uh, a written note and a mental note to myself that this isn't sustainable. And thankfully, yeah. the crowds are back. Uh, the show is back on and the show is getting stronger, I believe. And we'll all be better people for this period. But uh, it did leave its toll emotionally on a lot of us, I think, in the yeah. fact that especially rugby where it's a physical game and a, a, yeah. and a fast game, it, it, you get so much energy from the public. Mm. And... I'm lucky to play at the top level of the game where you have full houses and minimum 10,000 every week. But 10,000 gives it a great atmosphere while mm. playing in a ground where you can hear, you mean, the calls from one touchline to the other and uh, just the, that lack of atmosphere. It, it, it's not how, how young boys and girls should be living their dreams. Yeah, absolutely. Um, lo a lot is written about the parallels between sport and business. What do you think we in business could learn from sport? Do you, would you have one or two tips that you could share with us? It's kind of a final question to you. Yeah, I think, Susan, I, um, I understand that the sporting environment is probably the capacity to be able to speak honestly or openly. There are far more direct channels, but I think for for business to to probably get where they want they're a little bit um quicker there may be uh, an environment or a pathway or a policy put in place where uh, di direct constructive feedback um could happen it seems to me and something that i'm struggling with a lot in the fact that no matter what age you are some people uh find it difficult to, to to have a conversation, an honest conversation with their, with their colleague. These are people in their mid-50s, 60s. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, you should think at that stage maybe, okay, the best route to getting the best result for the company would be if, if me and my colleague have this conversation as opposed to person A talking behind the back of mm -hmm. person B to person C. And it yeah. becomes a vicious circle where everyone loses. While I suppose that, that can happen a lot quicker in the sporting environment uh, where there's no, I suppose, human resource manager and <laughs> and there's less uh, boundaries in, in that regard. But I always find that, um, you know I mean, once there's a forum for uh, honest uh, feedback uh, among employees, I think um, the company will, will, will thrive. Now, on your own, you go faster together, we go further. We need people together. We need people united. We need people uh, on task. It's very difficult when you have, I suppose, especially in sport, the competitors are, there's very little between the teams that, you know I mean, uh, unity, buy-in is absolutely crucial. Yeah, and that whole communication piece is vital internally and with your customers. So, yeah, great. Did you bring yeah, point? And that's something that probably annoys me, Susan, and the fact that I yeah. find that we people use, well, the communication could be better. It's like people in, for example, uh, getting a red card in sport. You need your discipline to be better. Mm -hmm. Nonsense. No, you don't need your discipline to be better. You need your behaviours on a daily basis to be better. Uh, consistency of behaviours on a daily basis gives you the outcome you want, i.e. half a foot behind the offside line. When you tackle, you don't tackle around the face or the neck or the head. You tackle at highest around the waist. So for that, talking about discipline, it's like, as you say, communication. For me, it's a word. Actually, what are we looking for our employees or our, our uh, players to do? I think we have to be very specific, which maybe is what your point is and the fact yeah well communication yeah is a general point but talk to me coach what are you yeah. looking for yeah how to communicate it's probably what i should have said yeah exactly being more direct uh ron again thank you so much we really appreciate it that you've you know uh talked to our customers done q a sessions they come back to us and said it was fantastic again particularly during the pandemic 
when there's, there wasn't much to, to cheer about. So look, thanks a million. Uh, all our best wishes to your family. Uh, I, I'm assuming Rua is still mad at rugby. Does he want to play for France now that you're in France? That's a very good question. That's a very <laughs> good question. Uh, I think we just, we're trying all sports at the minute. You know, that's the yeah. most important thing. Right. And thank you to uh, Safko. Thank you to your brother, Jim. He's very a great good. mentor. Great, well, great listen, mentor. lovely chatting to you. And Thank keep you, Susan. supporting and Leicester, won't you? Keep supporting I will, Leicester. of course, yeah. I'll keep, I'll keep chasing the dream. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Thanks a million. See you, bye. See you, guys. Thank you.